And there it is, President Biden delivering a feisty and animated State of the Union address tonight. Probably one of the most political addresses I have ever heard uh, before a joint chamber at this time, drawing a sharp contrast with Republicans. And while he did not mention Donald Trump's name, he referred to his predecessor more than a dozen times, taunting Republicans at times. In a vigorous address, I want to bring in our chief political analyst, John Dickerson. John. Yes, a, a stem winder, uh, Nora. I'm going to pluck two words out of the speech that uh, President Biden used. He used each of them 13 times. One is the one you just mentioned, predecessor or my predecessor. Referring to Donald Trump as a threat to American democracy, as great as the one America faced in 1941 before World War II, you cannot set the stakes any higher than that in terms of defining who he is running against. The other word he used 13 times is fair. This is a policy argument he was making when he talked about uh, when he talked about lowering drug prices, helping teachers get paid more, helping others go up the ladder of opportunity, helping with housing. All of those policies, those are to help people who are, you know, in the middle class and lower. And how's he going to pay for it? By increasing taxes on the wealthy and corporations. It's a populist pitch aimed at fairness. The the speech will fade, but those two things, how he defines his opponent. Uh, and, and that notion of fairness is pretty much the argument from now until November. Nancy Cordes is our chief White House correspondent. And Nancy, you cover this president closely. Uh, he's been criticized for sometimes flubbing a speech, going off script. Tonight was a bit different. Nora, this seemed to me to be a speech designed first and foremost to show that Joe Biden has the stamina and the fire in the belly to go another four years. It was designed to be delivered with high energy. He even broke into a call and response at one point, and Democratic lawmakers played along. He told jokes, uh, but he came out of the gate criticizing Donald Trump on Ukraine and then on January 6th. That was unexpected. He accused him of unleashing chaos when it comes to reproductive rights, of pandemic pandering to Vladimir Putin. It seemed to me that this White House understood that one of the biggest obstacles to reelection for him are the persistent voter questions about the president's age. And the White House set out to try to address those questions with a speech in which he ad-libbed about everything from taxes to Snickers. <laughs> and, and Robert Costa, I was struck by that, too. We've covered so many of these State of the Union addresses where the president begins with domestic issues. It's foreign policy is not usually considered that interesting, but we are in a different era. And he began with Ukraine. He began with his predecessor and Putin and said, my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, do whatever the hell you want, saying he'll bow down. It's outrageous. It's dangerous. It's unacceptable. Nora, sometimes timing is everything in politics. And what happened just days ago, Super Tuesday, former Ambassador Nikki Haley got out of the race. President Biden tonight making a pitch to Nikki Haley's voters, traditional Republicans who might feel like they don't have a home in Donald Trump's Republican Party. He's quoting Ronald Reagan. He's talking about January 6th. And he's saying to them, I'm building a coalition that's not only progressives and Democrats, but could include some Republicans. And you look at sometimes a picture tells a thousand words. You see President Biden there mingling on the House floor. Democrats all smiles. Some centrists from the New Jersey delegation there. I saw Senator Bernie Sanders come up with a big grin to say hello to President Biden. They're happy tonight. The president kicked off his campaign with a forceful speech, giving Democrats in that room and nationally a lot of confidence that he has what it takes for a rough campaign against Trump. Ed he was speaking, you could hear Congressman Henry Cuellar of Texas say, You're on, you were on fire. Danny Davis of Illinois saying, you fired us all up. Those guys represent moderates in the party and urban liberals. This may have been a partisan speech designed to be a campaign kickoff. A little different from most state of the unions, but it meets the moment, the political moment we're in, and it's the speech Democrats have been desperately waiting for him to give. And now the question is, can he do this in a non-staged 
setting? Can he get out there on the campaign trail and deliver this in those border states or in some of these swing states, uh, something that his fellow Democrats have, have asked them to do more of? Don't just send the cabinet secretary to unveil the bridge that you say you built. Come yourself. Uh, they want to see the president more active. One of those battleground states is the state of Georgia, mm -hmm. which, of course, is going to be an upcoming trial uh, that Donald Trump faces for fake, fake electors there. And also in that state, of course, the very sad story about the student who was just murdered by an undocumented migrant. And this was one of those somewhat unscripted moments when you saw Joe Biden enter uh, the floor. He was confronted by Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia. She's wearing a red Make America Great Again hat, but she also has a pin with Lake and Riley. That's the name of that Georgia nursing student uh, that the Homeland Security Secretary says they were not notified that the alleged killer had passed um, uh, uh, offenses where he could have been deported, and he wasn't. So there is this back and forth blaming the federal government for what happened to this nursing student who was brutally murdered, allegedly, by a Venezuelan migrant. It has, she has come to symbolize, for some of these Republicans, the lack of federal action. And he ad-libbed during that speech. He picked up the pen. He said, I, uh, he said her name. Lake and Riley is someone that Donald Trump called the parents to express mm -hmm. sympathies. And he has framed this about migrant crime on the campaign trail. Joe Biden tried to revive this bipartisan bill that he negotiated or his White House negotiated with senators that he laid out would have surged resources and actually delivered on some of these conservative priorities, as you mentioned, Nora, at the top of the program, were actually endorsed by Border Patrol. One thing that was really striking to me, we were just seeing there President Biden interacting with Congressman Adam Schiff, who just faced a big primary in California, is he's losing among young voters. He's, he's struggling to get the young vote. And this speech felt different. It was almost like he had written it and had prepared it for social media clips. You cover technology for us. Yes, and you can see this living on Instagram, living on Snapchat, living on TikTok in these little moments to reach all the people who are definitely not watching tonight. And what's really interesting, too, on the economy, he's playing to people who really feel the pain of the current economic situation. He made a promise, though, that was entirely ad-libbed. He said the landing is and will be soft. That is implying that there will be no recession the rates will come down and jobs will be fine. That is a very, very big promise to be making when the road to inflation has been really bumpy and Chairman Powell at the Fed has been very hesitant to cut rates. One of the other things I would note here, Nora, is in the most extensive comments I have seen to date, the president did something that progressive voters have asked for, which is to acknowledge Palestinian casualties in this war in Gaza. He said upwards of 30,000 people killed. Three pages, three and a half pages on Israel and Hamas and that conflict. This is something that he saw at the ballot box, Democrats saying to him they don't support his and policies. we know that as we are approaching Ramadan, this is a key moment because the president hoping to get some sort of ceasefire before what could be a very dangerous situation as this humanitarian cast catastrophe is unfolding. Robert. To, to build on what Joe Ling was saying with her excellent reporting, the headlines are going to be foreign policy, the, the nods to his predecessor, Donald Trump, but a lot of economic news in this speech. You see the president really making a, a, a pitch to labor voters, union voters nationwide, Sean Fain, the United Auto Workers president up in the first lady's box. And you saw him take on corporate America with strong language, address antitrust issues, corporate size and scope and, and power in this country. This was, as Ed said, a populist speech, a progressive speech. He needs those voters to come out, not be drifting towards Trump on the populist front, on the economy, not just on foreign policy. I want to bring in Major Garrett because he's followed Congress and president so closely for so many years. Your take on, on his remarks tonight. Let's not overcomplicate this, Nora. This was a base mobilization campaign speech. Yes, it has the trappings of the State of the Union address, but almost every policy priority the president identified, and even those, as Margaret mentioned, specifically re we're referencing Palestinian civilian deaths in Gaza, is about shoring up and re-energizing a Democratic constituency in preparation for the general election campaign. In this era of negative partisanship, where the most important thing for a political leader to do is marshal and energize your base and then find whatever additional voters you can, tonight's speech was exactly tailored to that imperative. And isn't that so critically important? Because we've seen the reason that Donald Trump is leading 
Joe Biden in seven of these battleground states and in most national polls is because he is underwater with his own base. It continues to show there's a lack of enthusiasm among Democrats versus Republicans, less eagerness and excitedness to go out and vote. And, and let me ask, because people have talked about President Biden's age. Um, what did he show tonight? Was he trying to put to, to, de put to rest rather doubts about, about his vigor? Absolutely. And they won't be put to rest by one speech, uh, but he did prove he can go an hour or more. There were no, <laughs> there were no major mistakes. Um, and, you know, one of the uh, biggest moments from his speech last year, Nora, was unscripted. Um, it was on Social Security, where Republicans were booing, pushing back on a point he made. And he said, oh, well, you don't want to cut Social Security? Okay, great. I'll take note of that. And it's almost like he said, okay, this, this year I'm going to do a lot more of that. And yeah. so he kept calling out Republicans saying, oh, you don't like my conservative border security mm -hmm. bill? I want to get the take of uh, some of our contributors, Democrats, Republicans, who've been inside on many of these campaigns and know the ins and outs of that. A Ashley Etienne, a uh, Democrat who recently worked for Vice President Kamala Harris. Ashley, so good to have you. What did you make tonight of this remark and of the president's remarks? And do you think it puts to rest some of these concerns among the Democratic base? Oh, absolutely. The president silenced all the haters tonight. It felt like he was Mayweather in, you know, in a ring. He was just punch after punch after punch. I think the Democrats barely sat down. It was so high energy. And I agree with what everyone else has said. This speech was made for ads. I mean, if you look at the speech, it's short, pithy points. But the one part that I really, really appreciated about it is he addressed all of his vulnerabilities from the border to the economy to um, um, to abortion and put the responsibility for inaction squarely at the doorstep of the Republican Party and said on many occasions, bring me the bill, including on the border, bring me the bill, I'll sign it. I'll take action to reinstate Roe versus Wade. So that's what I thought was so really so powerful about this speech it was it was one of those speeches that I think not just was gonna is gonna energize the base but it's also targeted to those Nikki Haley voters that are trying to find a home and I think they can find a home with all of these issues that the president laid out today and you can see as the chamber is emptying um, many of the Democrats remaining and the president he's still there at 1045 1045 at night I want to bring in uh, Terry Sullivan our CBS News political contributor who has worked for many Republican campaigns and I want to do want to ask you Terry because it was noteworthy to, to watch the House Speaker Mike Johnson for the first time um, there behind him the times that he did stand up the times that he didn't some of your colleagues like Mike Murphy have said I never thought in my life Time I would see a Republican House Speaker who won't stand and clap for stopping Russian military aggression into Europe. Your take? Yeah, look, it, it is uh, in the State of the Union, the president is king. He controls the room, and it is difficult to be anybody else, be it in that room or even uh, as we're about to see the follow up speech, it's a difficult. Uh, difficult thing to follow, a tough act. He's in control, and, and he had a lot of energy tonight, and it was tough to understand, was this a campaign rally? Or was this was this a State of the Union speech? So I think I think he took a lot of Republicans uh, flat-footed. He, he certainly had the energy, but I'm not sure that it was a traditional, as you said, North the beginning. This was a much more political speech than a normal State of the Union. He seemed to be even trolling a lot of the Republicans, looking for to engage them in a dialogue in the uh, in this more so than than give a typical State of the Union speech. Terry Sullivan, right, bringing up that word trolling, that was sort of a remark we made as well. He was engaging with them on many different occasions. I want to go to Scott McFarland because he was actually in the room. He covers Congress for us. Scott, what did you see? Two different people were moved during the course of this address, Nora, both in the upper levels. They were spectators, one screaming about the death of a U.S. service member. Another person just behind me yelled, you lie, when the president was addressing issues involving the Middle East. But what strikes me most, if the president is back here next year, wins re-election, gives another State of the Union address, dozens of the people he was looking at on the floor will not. There is a retirement wave underway in Congress right now by the dozens 
these people are calling it quits, leaving at the end of this year, frustrated by the gridlock and the toxicity of the politics in Washington. And I'll note something else, Nora. This is always an extraordinary day, the State of the Union Day in Congress. It kind of already was an extraordinary day in Congress. The phone lines were jammed by angry TikTok users. Congress today moved swiftly towards a bill that could lead to TikTok either divesting from its Chinese-based company or getting banned in America. That consumed this day before this historic address. Scott McFarlane, thank you.